All right, so I am gonna get cooking. Um, let me just sort of start off with the screen sharing. All right, so hey, uh, welcome to uh, Astronomy 3002, uh, Techniques in Astronomical Spectroscopy. Woo! Um, gosh, what to talk about? Uh, well, you probably figured this out already because you're like here. Um, the way the class is set up is it's asynchronous. That means that the lectures are recorded and you can watch every time. But I know the, like that's not the best thing for everybody because you can't ask questions, you can't stop me. Um, some people like a little more structure in uh, in what's going on then. So if if you want, um, the lectures are recorded every Monday and Wednesday at eleven o'clock uh, a.m. Um, and it, they'll be available by Zoom. So you can do the Zoom thing. You can come in. You can watch me do the lecture, and you can actually just go, hey what the hell did you just say? I have no idea what that's about. And we can talk about it more. It can be more interactive and a little bit more like, you know, back in the day um, when we weren't doing all this Zoom stuff. I should also say, um, normally when I do these things, um, I've got a big projection system and stuff and I, I do it using that. Um, but today it's busy with the, uh, with the inauguration and everything. So, um, this is sort of the, the fallback, uh, fallback. So, but on Monday then, um, expect to see that, uh, too, a lot more like a, a traditional lecture. And I want to say then for those of you who are here, if I, if I do say something, if you do have a question, just unmute yourself and just stop me just go what was that I, I don't know what you're talking about or you didn't explain that well and um and you know that, that that's what you're here for so feel free to do that all right so um we're going to start off then just with the syllabus because that's where you start on the first day i guess it makes sense to explain the course and stuff um so what's on the screen is the uh is the as you learn site and yes that was a brilliant idea I've added the Zoom link for the lectures to the As You Learn site, so you can just go there and, and click on that and uh, uh, join the lecture. Um, all right, so uh, let's see. Okay, yes, the syllabus. There we go. If you click on it, then there's the syllabus. Um, yes, that's me. I'm Dr. Briley. Um, in normal situations, I'm in Garwood 313. Um, not right now. Uh, I do have office hours on Monday and Wednesday, three to five, and also Tuesday, 1230 to two. Um, and these will also then be over the, the same Zoom link. Everything you'll do then is with that same Zoom link. Um, also got a telephone number. Feel free to call. Uh, I ain't going to be there to answer, but if you leave a message, it gets digitized and emailed to me. I should also say for office hours, if you can't make those office hours, uh, just send me an email and we'll set something up. Um, and speaking of email, yeah, that's my, my email right there. So um, we already talked a little bit then about the lecture format. It's a synchronous 100% online. Lectures recorded Monday and Wednesday, 11 to 11.50. Um, and, you know, if you, if you can be there, great. If you can't, though, it gets basically recorded and put on as you learn. Um, I would expect, you know, by, by the afternoon. Um, and, and you can sort of watch it at your leisure. Um, and I, I need to be careful about that, though, because um, don't, like, not watch anything until like, oh, whoa, there's an exam. Oh, wait, I have 16 hours of lecture to watch. Um, uh, really, I, there's an expectation. I sort of expect you to watch it, you know, before the next lecture um, or, you know, before the, the next, uh, you know, maybe not so much for that, but before the next lecture um, and certainly before uh, an exam then and before the, you know, you start the homework, you want to keep up with it. Maybe I'll just leave it like that. And, and that's the nice thing about doing the uh, the synchronous stuff though, where you have to be there, uh, that that maybe keeps you from falling behind. So think about it, about doing it that way. All right, so the purpose of the course then is just to, to, to I wanna use the word play around, but play around um, with with the, the fundamentals of spectroscopy and, and looking at what spectroscopy is, how do we do spectroscopy, what can we learn from spectroscopy. It's a it's an observational technique and we'll of course get into it in great detail. Um, we'll talk about how spectrographs work and you'll get into sort of designing a spectrograph then um, with gratings and uh, collimators and stuff like that. Um, we'll talk about the MK spectral classification system. You probably remember that from introductory astronomy with OVAF, GKM, 
Oracle Hall. Um, we'll get a lot more into that then than you did in, uh, in introductory astronomy and start really thinking about why we see these differences in the spectra of stars. I mean, fundamentally, the compositions of stars are all remarkably similar, yet their spectra are wildly different. And so what's up with that? What's causing that then? Um, likewise, then looking at spectral energy distributions and radial velocities. And towards the end, we'll even use the spectra of stars then to, uh, to figure out what they're made out of, uh, to actually get abundances out of them, um, which is kind of cool, kind of fun. That's actually what I do for a living. Um, if I go back to when I was starting out, it was probably like a lot of people want to do the black holes and the general relativity and the cosmology and stuff. And I thought the compositions of stars was that's deeply boring. Um, who cares how much strontium there is in a star or europium or something like that? And it wasn't until a lot later that I learned that those tell us where the star came from on this idea that the different processes produce different elements. Did the star, did the material I see in this star today then come from the slow neutron capture processes in an intermediate mass AGB star that took a couple billion years to evolve? Or are these rapid neutron capture processes from a star that, you know, the star before then, it's supernova then and made all of these really heavy elements. And, and looking then at where stars come from and, and the material that they're made out of and, and thinking that as you know, some sort of a fingerprint to think about what was going on before the stars uh, formed and it gets into all galaxy formation stuff like that and so more about that later then um all right uh so I should also mention then that for the class um I'm getting ahead of myself though there is the lab and for the lab then we will actually be taking data and reducing data and it's sort of mentioned here then uh basic techniques using the iraf uh basic techniques using iraf in the reduction of ccd spectra oh boy iraf stands for image uh, image reduction and analysis facility it's older than you are might even be close to older than your parents. Um, and it, it's since been depreciated, but at the moment it's still the best and easiest way to reduce uh, spectra on CCDs. Um, slowly, as Python becomes more popular then, um, there, there are Python techniques that, are, that people are writing to do this, but we're not there yet. And not everybody is a, a maybe super proficient in, in Python um, at this point. And so this is just a package that we're end, gonna end up using then uh, to reduce the spectrum. More about that when we get to the labs. Um, there is a textbook, um, Optical Astronomical Spectroscopy by Kitchen. Um, I, I really hope you read it and expect you to read it. Um, a lot of what we're going to talk about then is sort of supplemented or uh, almost sort of, yeah, I'm not even going to say, comes from um, sort of a, a, an unofficial textbook then um, that was written by Dr. Gray and that I've been modifying then um, that will also be handed out. And I'll show, you, I'll show you that in a second then. Um, there are going to be, there's going to be some homework then, I think maybe about seven homeworks um, over the course of the, the semester. And also then a, a sort of a final project then exercise where you do some abundance work, something like that. They're going to make up 25 they're going to make up 25% of the grade. Um, they're going to also then, uh, there's going to be an exam. There's basically a midterm and a final. Um, and each of those then will be 25% of the grade. And then there's also the lab, which will be another 25% of the, the, the grade. Any questions so far? I love it when I'm making sense. Okay, um, the lab then, it's sort of good news, bad news. Um, the bad news is, of course, with COVID, uh, we won't be able to go out to the telescope and all observe together. And and that's really sort of disappointing because um, that's... Well, that, that's a lot of fun. That's that's kind of what at least some of us get into this for. Um, the good news, though, is that we'll be using the 32-inch telescope then out at uh, Dark Sky Observatory in the GM spectrograph instead of the uh, instead of the Rankin telescope. Uh, the CCD on the spectrograph there is is out of commission, so we have to use the big one. Woohoo! Um, and there'll be then a, uh, a series of projects that you're going to do. 
uh, with the telescope then collecting spectra, reducing, analyzing spectra. Um, your lab instructor, if you had, uh, well, actually it's required, you had observation, observational astronomy. So you know Mr. Hawkins, he'll be the lab instructor. If you had photometry, he'll be the lab instructor then. And the lab then will count 25% of your grade. The labs then are on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. I believe they start at seven. There are 12 students in this class. So I'm pretty much gonna guess that there'll be three teams of four. And again, uh, Mr. Hawkins will set you up and organize all of that. And and again, we'll be, we'll be pretty much over Zoom. The nice thing though is just like the Rankin telescope, um, the, the 32 inch DSO can be run entirely remotely. And you'll see um, sort of later on, um, it's even got, uh, even got robotic capabilities where you can feed it a list of stars and you just go to bed um, and it observes them for you. Um, all right, moving on. Ah, the grading scale, there we go. So that's pretty much sort of a standard grading scale. Um, shouldn't be a surprise there. And note then subject to change. Um, uh, if it does change, I sort of have a policy where I may lower the grade you need for an A, but I will never raise it on you. So maybe think about it that way, then maybe these are the minimum percentages then that you need for these grades. Um, you may get that same grade with a lower percentage uh, depending on how things turn out. All right, so the outline then, this is sort of basic, my, my best guess, what we're gonna be talking about then each day um, in each lecture, and you can sort of go through there. Um, and I don't know what to say about that. These are what we're gonna be talking about then, how spectra are formed, how they're formed, how do you, how does a spectrograph work, uh, spectral classification, whole lecture on early stars, whole lecture on late stars, peculiar stars, how do you figure out radial velocities, how do you visit, figure out the physical parameters, parameters of stars. Then a few lectures then will be spent um, basically working with, at that point you should have data from DSO and that'll be working with IRAF then in, in reducing your data and, and how to do that. And so um, I sent an email out about this. I, I'm, the problem is IRAF runs under Linux and there's several other um, tools that we're gonna be using that are also um, Linux based. And I'm imagining not everybody has Linux, a Linux computer at home um, or that you, you know, even if you, I don't know, even if you want to build one, I don't know how, how capable you would be with that. Um, so what I've done is I've, I've made a virtual uh, Linux machine that you can download. It runs under a free software package called VirtualBox. And it basically emulates a computer on your computer uh, using that virtual machine. So it's a virtual Linux machine, IRAF, and everything you'll need for this class is pre-installed on it. And it runs then under Windows and it runs under Macs and it runs on Linux. Um, the big issue there is, a, the image right now is about, I think about 15 gigabytes. You'll probably need about 20 gigabytes um, all said and done. And I'm not sure, I'm worried not everybody has that kind of space lying around on your hard drive. Um, but I don't know another way to do this because we can't get into room 332 and use the Linux computers there. Um, the nice thing is, you know, then you don't have to go to campus and go to that room to, to work on this stuff. Um, the downside, though, is just you, you need some hard drive space. So if that's going to be a problem, um, let me know, like, immediately. And that having been said, I'm not sure what I can do about that. I think tonight I'm going to spend some time looking at how to make that image smaller. So any questions about that? We'll take that as a no. Woohoo! Okay, um, so we'll spend a couple lectures, looks up basically a couple weeks reducing the uh, the spectra then, and get back then into the lectures like how do you figure out radii and masses and other physical parameters of stars? Uh, how can you figure out temperature and surface gravity from a star from just from its spectrum? Uh, doing a little bit of modeling then, and actually at the end figuring out then the chemical compositions um, of some stars. All right, so that's basically the class. Oh yeah, and there's a final um, at the end of all that. Um, 
The other stuff on the syllabus then is basically the same stuff you see on every syllabus then uh, about the, uh, the Office of Disability Resources. Um, feel free to contact them and they'll work with me then uh, for any accommodation you might need. Um, there's the inclusive excellence statement then that um, it's very important that we basically have an environment, you know, that, that, that's bias free without discrimination and harassment. And if you think any of that's going on or I can be any help with that, um, let me know or talk to Dr. Burris. Um, especially now then with food insecurity, there is a, a food pantry both uh, at the university and the department maintains one. I'm not sure what's going on with that with the COVID thing. Uh, but again, um, you, can, you can ask me about it or ask Dr. Burris about it, or so there's some links there um, that, that you can follow um, um, if, if, if that's going on. Um, uh, any sort of, uh, how do we wanna say this? Any, any sort of, uh, let's see, I don't wanna use the word harassment, but, but anything going on with any sort of harassment issues, um, there's a bit in here then about re reporting obligations then. Um, and uh, gosh, I'm just gonna let you read that and come talk to me um, if, if you'd like to talk about that. I'm never sure what to say about these things. Um, there's also then, uh, Although we are meeting entirely not in person, I did want to put the uh, face covering policy on there because that's critical in slowing down um, what's going on. So uh, just be sure you're aware of that face covering policy and it is critical um, that we, uh, we sort of mask up out there. And then there's finally then the link then to all the other stuff like the attendance policy and student engagement then um, that you can follow then on this link. All right, woohoo, there's the syllabus, questions. All right, well, I will take that as no questions. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing that. Um, all right, excellent, we got a thumbs up, woohoo. Um, all right, okay, well, if we are good, um, I'm just, oh yeah, um, uh, hold on, I'm going back to that. <laughs> um, hold on, I forgot one other thing. All right, so I'm gonna go back, hold on. There we go. I'm going to go back to the As You Learn page and already posted then. Um, I had mentioned sort of the unofficial text um, for the course. Uh, part one is already up there if you click on it. There it is. Um, I would suggest maybe giving this a read. Um, we won't meet again until Monday, so give this a read. Um, oh, yeah, that also reminds me. Don't forget, no labs this week. Labs will start next week. Um, so. Uh, next Tuesday. Um, all right, so where am I going with this? All right, um, all right, oh yeah, here it is. So uh, it, the, the first part then is just sort of an overview of astronomical spectroscopy and how spectra are produced, things like that, uh, which is basically what we're gonna start with and what this first lecture is on. So again, I encourage you to hop over to the As You Learn site and, uh, and give that a, uh, a read. So without further ado, let's see if I can switch to the fancy presentation. Oh, <laughs> hold on, I'm working on it. All right, and then screen. All right, so y'all see the title page, right? I can't see you anymore, but. Yes, we can see it. Sweet, yep, okay. I can. All right, so. Um, Oh uh, gosh, all right. So well, maybe maybe we should even start about what is spectroscopy and why do we do it? All right, well, um, I'm presuming you're, you're sort of familiar with it because you signed up for it, or at least the basic idea of using uh, a grating or a prism or some sort of dispersive element then to split the light from a star or a nebula or some object then split it up into its colors or wavelengths or frequencies or energies, something like that. And then to look at how much light you get at these different frequencies or colors or energies, whatever you wanna, however you wanna to think about it though. And, it's a, it's a super important tool um, in astronomy 
because you can you can look at stars then and figure out what they're made out of. You can look at stars and and figure out how they're moving. You can look then at planetary nebula and figure out their compositions, their expansion rates, their densities, their temperatures. And if if you look at the things that we figured out then with spectroscopy, I mean this was how we figured out the Milky Way is a spiral galaxy by looking then at the the radial velocities, the motions of stars. You know this is this is how we know the universe is expanding by going out and doing spectroscopy of distant galaxies and going, oh, look, there's the calcium two line. <gasps> look at how red it is. It's moving away from us. And, and then, oh, wait a minute, redshift and distance are correlated with each other. Um, this, this is how we understand the process of galaxy formation. Um, if you go out, um, there's, a, there's a little star cluster then known as Terrazan 7. It's a globular cluster. It's part of the, the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy, which is over on the other side of the Milky Way, currently colliding with our Milky Way. And if you look at the compositions of those stars that are in Terrazan 7, this little cluster then that's being carried along with this, this, this dwarf galaxy then, if you look at the compositions of those stars, they're very different from the compositions of the globular clusters and that we see in our own Milky Way. And there's a key there to, to, to this process and of galaxy formation. Thinking about our Milky Way and building up the Milky Way from a from a basically a merger process versus a, a single gas cloud collapsing. And if the, the, the objects then that the Milky Way formed from are like this little dwarf galaxy, well the clusters it's dragging along with it are different from the clusters we see in the Milky Way. Uh, you know, in, in the Milky Way right now. And oh, gosh, I, I, I wonder, well, probably not a lot of our clusters came uh, from little, you know, dragged in by little dwarf clusters. I wonder, you know, maybe not so much of the galaxy was built up by these merger processes. All right, I've totally digressed. If you've never had me before, um, I digress a lot. Um, but, but that's just an example, though, of, of some of the stuff then that you can learn from spectroscopy. It's a hugely important tool. And going out then, all right, going out and looking then through a spectrograph and what do you see? So, so you go, you take the light, you split it up into its colors. And if you looked with your eye then um, at the light coming out of the spectrograph and maybe from a star like the sun, um, you might see something like this where I've taken the, the light from the sun, I've split it, spread it out into colors and you see the different colors. Well, you'll notice though some very specific colors are missing. Or you might even say, oh, look, there, there are these dark lines in the spectrum where colors are missing. And you know what we call that, or that kind of a spectrum, especially because I put it on the slide here. We talk about it as an absorption spectrum or an absorption line, um, absorption line spectrum. And all right, so we've got an absorption line spectrum here. And what, what's cool though, or at least to me what's cool though, is you can look at certain little dark lines and and realize that, well, gosh, if I take calcium and I ionize it and I look then at the lines I get from ionized calcium, I'll get two lines right here, right at this very, very color, right at these exact wavelengths. And I'm here with ionized calcium here on Earth. Oh, look, I see the exact same two lines in the sun. Oh, so these are lines then that are due to ionized calcium. And this sort of little, oops, I'm getting ahead of myself, this sort of little dark bit here then, that's due to uh, the, the CN molecule. This little dark bit here then, this is due to the CH molecule. And there's a little bit of a G band, I'm sorry, a, a magnesium hydride uh, going on here. And, and you, you learn then that different elements create different lines that have very, very specific wavelengths. And you can go and you can look at objects in space and you see then these, these very same patterns of lines that are telling you then, oh, look, there, uh, there are these, these elements then that are out there in these objects. Um, real quick, um, trying to find it. Uh, I believe it is right here. There's a hydrogen line then at 4102 angstroms. And I think that's it right there. Um, what's it? Oh, no, I'm sorry. All right, I'm going to just jump ahead because I already, I already got ahead of myself. What we've got here on the bottom then is basically a plot. We're just looking at the wavelength in angstroms um, of, of the light we're looking at then. 
versus the, the intensity of the light, how much, we're, how much light then we're getting at these different wavelengths. And when you're doing spectroscopy, instead of looking at something like this, we almost inevitably do more of a plot like this where we look at the actual values as a function of wavelength, because it's a lot easier to go and you know, compare then you know, how much absorption am I getting here versus here. It's a lot easier to, to, to look at that on the graph as opposed to just looking at this sort of, you know, I don't know, is this one stronger than that? I don't know, I can't quite tell. Yeah, here with a graph, then you got the actual, you see the actual numbers, you got the actual data. Back to my question though, 4102 angstroms and hydrogen absorption. What's the sun made out of? And I'm hoping you're all just hitting your unmute buttons and saying hydrogen, mostly hydrogen. Well, where, why, where's the hydrogen then in the spectrum? Why is the hydrogen so weak um, in the sun? Maybe it's not, well, maybe the sun is mostly calcium. The strongest uh, absorption lines in the sun's spectrum then are these calcium lines right here. Sun must be mostly calcium. Eee, all right, so it, it actually gets um, fairly complicated with, with why, why aren't the hydrogen lines as strong as they should be when you think about the actual composition of the sun. And this, this was a big thing back in the early 1900s and people trying to figure out then what was up with that. And, and of course, as you might ex expect, um, we'll talk a lot more about that. Maybe even remember the, the, the answer then um, from, uh, from Astronomy One. Um, all right, uh, moving on, there are other types of spectra. Um, here would be an emission line spectrum where instead of seeing light missing at certain colors, you see excess light or almost no light at any other colors, except for these very, very specific colors or wavelengths or energies. Um, and so we talk about these then as emission lines where there's hardly any light, hardly any light. And all of a sudden there's a lot of light then right at this wavelength and then hardly any, hardly any, hardly any. And, and you, well, gosh, how is that different? What's going on there? And I'm hoping in the backs of your heads, you're going, oh yeah, Kirchhoff's laws. I remember that now where if we've got a cool gas in front of a, a hot gas or a black body source, something hot and dense gas, um, some sort of continuous spectrum. If we've got cool gas in front of that, we'll see an absorption spectrum. If I've got then just some gas that's being excited without anything behind it, like maybe a cloud of hot gas, something like that, then um, I'm gonna see these emission lines then from gas that's had its electrons knocked up into higher energy, energy levels. Yeah, getting ahead of myself, getting ahead of myself. Um, all right, I, I guess I should back off though a second and um, I maybe refresh ourselves with like what light is. And presumably you remember this, the nature of light then, it's an oscillating electromagnetic wave uh, traveling through space. Um, it's, there's, a, there's basically a magnetic component and an, and an electric component or a magnetic field and an electric field. And remember changing electric fields create magnetic fields, changing magnetic fields create electric fields. And this idea then of this wave propagating through space where the electric field creates the magnetic field, which creates the electric field, which creates the magnetic field, then off it goes off then um, out into space. And because the fields create each other then, you don't need a medium for the wave to travel through. You don't need like sound needs air um, and waves on water need water. I'm never quite sure how to say that one. But this idea though, that these, these electromagnetic waves then can, can propagate through empty space, can propagate through um, the vacuum of space. And we can talk about the distance between the peaks, wavelengths, we can talk about then how, how fast some point on the wave then is going up and down, how many times per second some point on the, the wave then is going up and down, how many times per second it goes up and down. Oh, that would be frequency. And you also then remember the product of the wavelength and the frequency will be the speed of the wave or for light in a vacuum, then basically the, the, the speed is equal to the wavelength times the frequency, light in a vacuum, then it's always C, the speed of light. Um, and, and so that's a constant, the wavelength times the, uh, the frequency of light, then that, that's always going to be equal then to the speed of light, which is a constant. Um, gosh, so much to talk about. Uh, all right. When we're looking at light then, remember our eyes can only see a very, very small fraction of the total spectrum of possible electromagnetic waves. They can go from extraordinarily long waves then that are bigger than the planet Earth 
um, all the way down to, to extraordinarily short wavelengths and that are smaller um, than, than atoms. Um, very, very short wavelength, very, very high frequency light, or I should say electromagnetic waves. And so here's sort of the whole spectrum of, uh, of wavelengths and we've got here then wavelengths in nanometers uh, all the way up then to uh, to megameters um, in wavelengths and and depending on the wavelength then we we use different words to characterize that light so going from the shortest wavelength light shortest wavelength electromagnetic radiation that that would be gamma rays x-rays ultraviolet visible light near infrared far infrared microwave and radio um, what we can see with our eyes though the range of visible light then basically from about 4,000 angstroms to about six, 7,000 angstroms, somewhere in there, yeah, it'll go 7,000 angstroms then. Um, that's the range of visible light. Um, it's just a small fraction of the total range of, of electromagnetic uh, wave, uh, wavelengths and you, you can have for these things. Um, I should mention, um, it is actually, uh, what do we wanna say? You can do spectra then with just about any one of these wavelength ranges. It's just that your spectrograph is going to be different. Um, and gamma ray spectrograph, so an extraordinarily long uh, wavelength radio spectrographs and are very, very tricky things, but there are ultraviolet spectrographs and infrared spectrographs and X-ray spectrographs. Um, um, you can do, basically, if it's an electromagnetic wave, you can do spectroscopy of it. Um, all right. Oh, also, I should uh, mention, again, you presumably remember this then, that the energy of the electromagnetic wave is proportional to the frequency. So the energy of an electromagnetic wave would be Planck's constant times the frequency, or in terms of wavelengths then, uh, wavelength then uh, remembering that the speed of light then is equal to the frequency times the wavelength, the energy then uh, is also HC, Planck's constant time C divided by the wavelength. So as we get to shorter and shorter wavelengths, then we're talking about higher and higher uh, energy electromagnetic waves. For the purpose of this class, though, um, we're pretty much going to talk about visible light, maybe a little bit in the infrared, or maybe a little bit in the ultraviolet, a little bit um, sort of the uh, a, a little bit shorter than what you can see with your eye. But we're pretty much sticking with uh, with visible light. All right, and I sort of gave this away. Um, thinking about why you see different spectra. And basically it depends on the physical conditions that you're looking at. Um, this idea that, and this isn't, this isn't my favorite drawing, but I kind of like it because it does show everything on one page. And this idea then that you've got um, a black body and that's some object then that, that's hot or that has some heat associated with it and is dense. And so typically in, in astronomy, then we might talk about, you know, the interior of a star as a black body source. It's certainly hot. It can be incredibly dense. And for, for practical purposes, then the interior region of a star might be considered a black body or the surface of a white door for a neutron stand. I'm not gonna go with those have atmospheres. All right, I'm, I'm just gonna leave it at that then. Um, and if, if you have a black body, then, um, Oh, like back in the old days when you had the incandescent lights, remember those that had the filament in them? And so this thing gave off light because you had a piece of metal like tungsten and a little tungsten wire in this thing and you ran a bunch of current through it and you heated that piece of tungsten up to thousands of degrees and you got light then that came off that thing as opposed to the LEDs or the compact fluorescence that we have today, which is very, very different processes to create light. But back in the day, those incandescent light bulbs, and those were black body sources because you've got a piece of metal then and you just heated it up to, to a few thousand degrees and it gave off this light. And I, I know this is all stuff from astronomy one and, and it's all stuff you remember, but just in case, just a refresher. Um, and if you take that light and you grab your spectrograph then and you say, well, I'm gonna do spectroscopy and you split that light then up into its colors, you see all the colors of the rainbow then. You end up seeing then a continuous spectrum and we call it continuous then because it's continuous, because there are no breaks. There's no, there, there's no gaps in the, the colors. There's no sort of so it's points we've got like, oh, a lot of excess color here. And then right next to it, it's hardly any color. It's a nice continuous distribution of light. The situation is a little bit different though, where if you have a hot black body like this, it's putting out all the colors of the rainbow. Um, again, we'll just sort of focus on visible light here. We'll 
think more of stars. Um, it, it, this might be the interior of a star. It's putting out all the colors of the rainbow. And but and here you are with your spectrograph waiting to split the light up into its colors. And bet but between you and that black body, then you've got some cloud of cooler gas. And so that light, in order to get to you, has to pass through that cloud of cooler gas. And you remember then the dance of the electrons as that light is passing through that cloud of cooler gas, the atoms and molecules that, that make up that cooler gas. They've got their electrons in some energy state, probably the ground state or some low energy state. The light comes by. Oh, wait a minute, light. Oh yeah, light is energy. E is equal to HC over lambda. Then there's energy associated with that light. And if that energy is just right, the electrons in the atoms and molecules of that gas can absorb that light jump up to a higher excited level. They don't like to be there, they jump back down, but the, in jumping back down, they give that energy off, but all, in some other direction. And so the light whose energy then was equal to these allowed transitions of the electrons jumping up, that, that light then as it's passing through that gas, if those electrons absorb that light, jump up, jump back down, they're gonna send that light off in some other direction when they jump back down. And so those colors, those energies, those frequencies, those wavelengths of light then, are going to be removed from the black body, the black body continuous light then on its way to you. And if you whip out your spectrograph or your prism then, and you look at the light that you see through this cloud of cooler gas with the black body behind it, you'll see an absorption spectrum and you'll see then these missing colors. Hey, absorption spectrum. And that's what you see in a, a, a star like the sun. You've got the hot interior and then the atmosphere around it then is a layer of thinner, cooler gas. And that's what gets you then um, the absorption line spectrum. Back in the day, and again, yes, digression coming. If you read old astronomy stuff then from again, the early like 1900s, and they talked about the reversing layer of the sun. That's what they called the photosphere, the reversing layer, because it was this layer of cooler gas then that imprinted the absorption line then on the absorption lines then on the solar spectrum. I think that's a lovely name, the reversing layer. Um, anyway, sorry. The other situation though, is if you have a cloud of gas and you're looking at it and you've got nothing behind the cloud of gas, you've got no light source behind the cloud of gas. It's a low density gas. And I get this, this is what annoys me then about this, uh, about this diagram. Then it's this cloud of cooler gas. Um, uh, this could also be a cloud of hot gas and often is a cloud of hot gas, but you're looking then at, a, at this cloud of gas and behind it, there is no light source. So the only light you're gonna get is the light that's coming coming from that cloud of gas. And you can run into a situation where that gas is hot and you've got then collisions between the atoms and molecules in that gas. Oh, wait a minute, collisions are energies. There's energy associated with collisions. They can kick the, the collisions can kick the electrons up, don't like to be there, they jump back down, they give off light in some random direction. But they're gonna give off the, the, the very specific energies, very specific wavelengths of light as they jump back down, very, very specific colors. Or you could have a situation like they're showing here, where you've got a cloud of cooler gas, a black body, the light's going through it then, the atoms and molecules, their electrons are absorbing that light, re-emitting it then in, in, in uh, different directions. And some of that light then that's re-emitted is gonna end up then being scattered to you. And the next thing you know, you're looking at an emission line spectrum. Or if it's just a cloud of hot gas with nothing behind it, you'll see an emission line spectrum. If you have some process that's taking a cloud of low density gas and kicking the electrons up, when they jump back down, they're gonna give off that light. Very specific wavelengths and colors, you'll see an emission line. All right, spent way too much time then on something that's hopefully reviewed. But I'm gonna stop and see if there are any questions. All right, I can't see anybody because of the PowerPoint thing, but, but I'm not hearing anybody, so I'm gonna presume we're good. All right, and looking at this, we've got a couple minute, more minutes in, so I wanna go on and I wanna talk about this, this idea then of maybe we'll start off with, well, what do you see from one of these continuous sources? What do you see then from an object then that's hot and dense, I don't, I don't even really need to use the word hot, that has any sort of uh, thermal energy associated with it. It's got a temperature then that's above zero degrees Kelvin um, and it's dense. And we talk about the, the light that we get from those objects as black bodies. And that, that's really an idealization. 
Um, but if, if you look at something like in your room right now that's solid and you go, oh, it's about, what's the temperature, about 270 Kelvin, something, no, about 300 Kelvin um, in your room, and you made a plot then, wavelength then, versus how much light you're getting, you'd see something like this then, where, where at long time, at, at shorter wavelengths, you've got hardly any light, and then somewhere here, sort of in the infrared, you'd see a whole bunch of light. There's a peak where most of the light's coming out at, but it's a continuous distribution then um, of light, and it's a source of a continuous spectrum, and oh, there's so much to talk about here. I want to back, back off just a second, though, and maybe... Maybe I'll end with this then. Just this idea of what's, why, why do we call it a black body? Why do we talk about black body spectra? And the idea is, is we're looking at the light being given off by something that's got a temperature associated with it. And I strongly, if, you, if you're gonna be an astronomer, then um, I, it's real, I really, really, I don't want to say insist, but very strongly suggest um, that you also take then um, the, the class in thermodynamics, because you'll actually get into this. And at the end, you'll be able to just sort of derive this from scratch, much like uh, now you can take F equals MA then and derive, oh, I just threw a baseball. Oh, look, it's a parabola. Um, you'll be able to do this just from scratch. Um, but the idea is if I've got a perfect emitter of light, um, well, it's also got to be a perfect absorber of light. And so the light that strikes it then, if it's a perfect emitter, it's also a perfect absorber. And if I think about one of these objects, say I have sitting on my desk then, a perfect emitter absorber of light, it's sitting on my desk, what's it going to look like? And, and I'm getting ahead of myself because I know you guys have, have seen all of this before. Um, but this idea of Wien's law, where um, it's actually sort of written here, um, where the peak, where most of the light being given off by an object then, just because it's hot, because it's a black body radiator then, um, just due to the vibration of the atoms and molecules, the bouncing around then of the atoms and molecules that make it up, that peak depends on the temperature. And the, the higher the temperature then, um, the shorter the wavelength of the peak, the, peak, the lower the, the temperature then, the longer the wavelength of the peak. And if it's an object then that's sitting in my room at room temperature, if it's a black body, if it's a perfect emitter of light, it's gonna be emitting the bulk almost the entirety, like 99.9999% of its light in the infrared. And am I gonna see that light? And you go, no, that's the infrared. You can't see infrared. Um, and so I, I won't be able to see the light that it's giving off. But at the same time, though, it's also a perfect absorber. It's a perfect emitter and it's a perfect absorber. So the light that strikes it gets absorbed. So I don't get any light reflected off it. And the light that it's emitting is all in the infrared. If I have it sitting on my desk, I'm going to look at that and go, well, that's really black. Hence the name black body. That's where that comes. It's sometimes confusing to people that you go, oh, look at all the light coming off that black body. And you're like, what? That's not black. That's really hot. That's where it comes from. And again, if you if you take thermal physics and um, you can sit and derive then the actual shape of this curve, how much light you're getting then from an object, from a black body then at a certain temperature as a function of wavelength. And that's known as Planck's law. Here it is right here then. And so we're looking at different wavelengths at a specific temperature. You say, oh, I got a black body then, 3000 Kelvin. Oh, I'm gonna look at these different wavelengths. I just plug in the different wavelengths into this equation at that temperature. That tells me then how much flux I get at those wavelengths. And again, the units for flux, ergs per second per centimeter squared per angstrom. Uh, wait a minute, what? Okay. so. I don't know if you've run across this yet, but astronomers tend to use CGS units. Spectroscopists tend to use angstroms for wavelength. And I've already started to do that. If you've had me for introductory astronomy, I was very careful to always use nanometers for wavelengths, but no um, uh, visible light spectroscopists, we tend to use angstroms. And you remember an angstrom then is basically, there are 10 angstroms in a, uh, in a nanometer then. So if you wanna do nanometers then, just take whatever I say and divide it by 10. 
Um, but that's the basic idea then is, is, uh, is angstroms. And also then astronomers tend to use CGS units, centimeters, grams, and seconds. And so you can already see that then when I talk about flux then is ergs per second per centimeter squared per angstroms. Um, I'm talking about per square centimeter. And remember an erg then is basically a joule um, except it's 10 to the negative seventh um, uh, joules. And so one erg is the CGS joule. It's just 10 to the negative seventh uh, uh, joules. And it's just historical. Astronomers are, if anything, historical. I mean, O-B-A-F-G-K-M. Um, all right, so we are, we got like a minute left or so, but I'm gonna stop right here and, um, just sort of punch on back and see if anyone has any questions. Is this, is this making sense? Yes, sir, it is making sense. Excellent. Yeah, Excellent. this sounds good. Okay. No, um, Tim? Oh, you're muted. Uh, I, I, was agree I was agreeing, it makes sense. Okay, Sorry. cool. So, so this is sort of review. This is sort of stuff from astronomy too, maybe. Um, it's, it's, it's gonna get a little bit more complicated pretty quick. So um, have a look then at on the As You Learn site that's sort of right up then of, uh, of part one. And uh, we'll pick up with this then on Monday and get into a little quantum mechanics and stuff. Not much, but, uh, but uh, all right. Okay, well, I hope, uh, I hope everybody, I won't see you again till Monday. So I hope everybody has a good weekend. And if you do have any questions about this, um, you know, just let me know, okay? Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. All right. Take yep. Care, thank everybody. you.